Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so my name's Anthony, and today we're going to talk about Python being the second best language for everything. If you've not heard this expression before, it was coined, I think, about 15 years ago by one of the core developers of Python. Um, and we're going to unpack this and try and understand what it means. Um, before we do that, I want to tell you a couple of stories. So this place on the right-hand side of the picture uh, is where I'm from. This is where I flew from uh, to get here. This is a small town in Australia. Um, there are 4,000 people living there. Um, there are t I'm a volunteer lifeguard as well uh, at this beach. Um, there are 200 uh, lifeguards in our town of 4,000 people. So 5% of the town um, are qualified lifeguards, which might sound a bit strange. Um, if you look at this picture, this thing here is a, almost like a catapult. Um, if you went swimming in here, you would be thrown out pretty quickly uh, into the ocean. Um, but because 5% of the people who live in the town are lifeguards, um, someone will probably pull you out of the water pretty quickly. Um, another challenge we have is there's another one of those currents at the top of the beach here. Um, this one is notorious. So if you're swimming there, you'll also get thrown out in the current. Um, the thing that happens at the weekends and the evenings is there is a, a bar here. Okay? And at the weekends, um, the reason nobody has drowned uh, for a very, very long time is because of the bar and because there are 200 lifeguards in the town. Um, and when people get in a situation where they would otherwise drown, normally somebody upstairs in the pub having a beer um, comes running down, uh, gets a boat, and goes and rescues them. So um, every year we have a, a race, a swimming race, um, from somewhere far south of that photo to the rocks. Um, and I competed in that race last year. And I was thinking, OK, I wonder how good my odds are of winning this race. Uh, I'm, I'm not an amazing swimmer, but I spoke to some of the other competitors and said, oh, how much swimming did you do? And they said, oh, not much since the uh, Olympics in 2004. <laughs> so, okay. So uh, when we started the race, I thought, you know what, I'm probably not going to win. I'm quite happy just finishing it. So bringing that back to Python, um, Python is the second best language for everything. Is that a compliment? I think it was kind of meant as a compliment that Python is flexible. Um, but you know, a lesson I teach my kids is if we play, we play to win. Um, so <laughs> what is the best? Uh, and why isn't Python the best? And can we make Python the best instead of being the second best? Um, but should Python even aim to be the best at everything? Is that even a suitable goal for Python? And what would that mean? So we're going to look at some types of applications and um, I guess where Python kind of ranks and what other factors are involved in that. So the first one is the web. So is Python the second best language for the web? Uh, so to answer the first question, what would be the best? The answer is kind of obvious. Um, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, if you stuck them all together, um, I guess would be the technology that you would use for the web. Second, maybe Python. Third, maybe PHP. It's debatable which way around that is because of WordPress. Um, but Python is a good technology, I think, for the web. It's not really that simple because can you even write a web application in a single language? Because you have the actual website itself, the interface. You've got some sort of code running the site. And then you've got data behind it as well. So. Web applications are actually comprised of normally multiple languages um, for the different layers. Some of those things are out of your control. You can't pick an alternative to HTML. HTML is your only choice. You can't style your site differently than CSS. CSS is your only option. So there are some things like JavaScript as well, which are bundled in the browser, um, and you don't really have an alternative to pick from. So if Python is the second best choice, it's not really Python's fault because the browser comes bundled with these things. But the way that most web applications work is that you have a browser that talks to a server. It makes a request, and it sends back HTML. And actually, Python's pretty good at this. 
Um, Django is great for this kind of scenario because you can run a web application in Django. Flask is a great option as well with Jinja to do templates. Um, so if you're producing HTML from Python, that's a pretty good option. Um, however, um, most websites need some sort of code in the actual app itself, in the front end. Um, and this is where JavaScript comes back again. So we don't just send back static HTML. Often you've got to use JavaScript in the front end. Um, and then things got more complicated because you've got a different UI for the desktop um, and a different one for mobile. So often we've got logic, we've got code sitting both in the server uh, and in the UI. Uh, and in that case, uh, servers can use Django Flask or Fast API, but for mobile, and I come to this one later, uh, you probably want to use Java Kotlin or Swift if it's a native mobile app. Uh, and this is something you can't really get away from uh, with Python. So coming back to JavaScript. So JavaScript was designed to run in the browser. So if Python is number two to JavaScript, um, is that really fair? Um, you can run JavaScript on the back end, so you can run server applications with Node.js, but there isn't really like an equivalent to Django or Flask for Node. These are huge projects. They're really mature. They're really flexible. There's like hundreds of extensions for Flask and for Django. Um, there is not really an equivalent for Node. So because all modern browsers bundle JavaScript, um, try and think more about how you can combine JavaScript uh, on the front end and Python on the back end. Uh, and Python will probably never be bundled with browsers. Maybe. So there's another project that's happening at the moment um, where they're taking Python code. Uh, they're compiling it using something called WASM, uh, which is the web assembly, uh, into a runtime. And then it's being loaded by JavaScript. And then that JavaScript is then run in the browser. What this means is that you can actually write Python code inside HTML that runs fully in the browser. So this is a new technology that came out like two years ago, I think. It's still experimental. Um, in the future, maybe we can write Python instead of JavaScript on the front end. Um, but at the moment, there are still some big caveats. It means your web application has to bundle Python itself, which is pretty huge. It's multiple megabytes. Um, the load times are quite slow. Uh, and most browser libraries are written in JavaScript. So if you want to build up an ecosystem, um, you're competing with the ecosystem of JavaScript. So in summary, JavaScript is an immovable object. Python is an unstoppable force. And even when Python is in the browser, it's going to involve lots of JavaScript. Um, and the web doesn't necessarily mean browsers. And Python is already strong on the back end. Uh, if you do web development, you're going to need to learn JavaScript regardless. So, OK, let's talk about something completely different, operating systems. So if you were to use Python to write an operating system, do you think that would be a good choice? Um, so operating systems work at their center with a kernel, and then they have these outer rings. So an operating system is comprised of uh, at its core kernel and then drivers that build out from that. Um, I've drawn a pie chart of the operating system language market share. Um, so it's a bit of a monopoly on C. Uh, all operating systems are written in C, pretty much, um, apart from some really obscure ones. Uh, that has a flow-on effect for everything on the desktop and on mobiles. So the system itself uh, communicates with the kernel, which communicates with device drivers, which communicate with applications. So the system does binary I.O. to talk to the kernel. That has a C API, because it's written in C. So all device drivers talk to the kernel using a C API. They use C types, C data structures. Uh, and then the device drivers use C then to communicate with the applications. What this means is that any implementation that needs to interface with drivers, with the kernel, needs to understand C data structures and the C API on Mac, Linux, and Windows. So when you think about what would run on a environment like an operating system, that would be the UI, audio, 3D, 2D graphics, networking, 
pretty much everything you would do on an, an application on a desktop needs to at some point talk to the operating system. Um, all those operating systems provide APIs with C and C++. Um, some have got C, other C-like languages, but it's all based on C. So Python's got a workaround for this, which is pretty cool. Uh, you can load C libraries and make calls to C APIs from Python. You can do that by writing an extension module, um, or you can do it directly in Python code. Uh, and as an example, I've got a Docker-like container runtime written in 100% Python. It's 150 lines of Python uh, at that URL. It was written as an example, um, but you don't necessarily have to use C uh, for everything. So there's a C types module you can use in Python. Um, and you can load libraries, and you can call functions, which is cool. But in practice, C APIs use a lot of data structures which are really hard to mimic or represent in Python. Things like pointers, um, yeah, Python doesn't really have that, so it's quite a challenge. Um, so that's operating systems. For embedded work, um, embedded systems are free from that constraint of them all being written in C. Um, there are some options if you wanted to write embedded systems in Python. MicroPython and CircuitPython are two cool examples. This robot on the left-hand side actually runs Python, which is a nice example. Um, if you're doing low latency processing or if you're writing a microcontroller for a washing machine, um, Python's probably not your best choice anyway. Um, assembly or C would probably be a better choice. Um, so yeah, this is an example of CircuitPython and MicroPython. Uh, you can use it to control low-level systems, which is really nice and really flexible. So in summary, the C API is a constraint on every platform. Uh, that's not going to change. Operating system vendors will support C and C++ first, and other languages second. So we'll always be playing catch-up. Uh, interfacing with C APIs from Python is possible, um, but it's not particularly fast. Uh, and Python is probably a poor choice when interfacing with a C API in a low latency application, like a system driver. So if you wanted to write a system driver or a network protocol in Python, you could do it, but it's probably not your best choice. Um, another type of application would be a user interface or a graphical application. So this is one that people complain about with Python. Why can't we write native desktop apps in Python? Um, so let's unpack that a little bit. So there are some GUI frameworks for Python. Um, and you, know, you can build like apps where you've got a button and some form controls and stuff like that. Uh, and you can distribute those. Distributing it is really hard because you have to bundle Python um, in your app. Um, and you can write some basic GUIs and stuff like that. However, um, most UIs don't look like that. They're not simple buttons and text boxes. Um, m pretty much all modern desktop applications rely heavily on 2D graphics from the graphics card. And all of those interfaces are designed for C and C++. Um, so these are two examples. One is PowerPoint. Um, you'd be amazed how much the graphics card has to do just to run PowerPoint, even when you're designing slides. Uh, the other example is Spotify uh, on the desktop. This uses a ton of C++. Um, and they designed their own 2D framework to base it, base it on. So Electron is, a, I guess, an example of where JavaScript has turned into an environment that you can write native desktop applications. So why can't we have Electron for Python? And it actually goes back to what I talked about earlier in the talk, uh, which is JavaScript is bundled in the browser. Um, and if you actually peel back the covers in Electron, it's really just the Chrome browser without the title bar um, and a whole bunch of extra stuff to talk to the local system uh, written in C++. So Python doesn't have that. Um, it doesn't have the ecosystem either that JavaScript already has. It doesn't have the hundreds of thousands of packages on NP NPM that are designed for doing UI work. So even if somebody could build something like Electron, the ecosystem doesn't exist. So it's going to be a real challenge. Uh, if we then look at mobile applications, so mobile apps are actually pretty similar to the constraints of operating systems. So Android is all written in Java. All the APIs are for Java. Um, you can use Kotlin, which is a 
superset of Java. Um, on, on iOS, uh, everything was designed for Objective-C and Swift. So basically, those are your two constraints. Uh, and anything you do has to interact using those interfaces. So mobile app development with Python is hard, um, but it's not impossible. And then one thing that's probably even harder <laughs> is gaming. Uh, this is one of my favorite games. This is uh, Forza Horizon 5. Um, could you make that in Python? Um, so the SDKs that you would have to use to um, work with the game controllers, audio, uh, networking, uh, and, and very importantly, 3D graphics, uh, are all written in C++. So if you did do it in Python, you'd have to write Python code that talks to C++, and you inherently create an overhead in that stack. Um, 3D graphics is all done on C++ APIs. You can do some basic 2D game stuff in Python, which I've seen. Um, somebody wrote a NES emulator in Python, um, and they discovered that it was, Python was actually too slow to run the NES emulator unless you use Cython to compile it. Uh, NES is a technology from 40 years ago. So what they kind of discovered was that you can kind of do it with Cython. It's a lot of work. Um, but importantly, when we go back to ecosystems, most game developers don't write a game engine and then write a game. They pick a game engine and they build on top of it. All those game engines are written in C++. So you basically have to start from scratch to write a game engine and then build on top of that, um, which would be a huge amount of work. So in summary, everything is written in C++ um, when it comes to UIs and graphic applications uh, with a star because Electron is an exception, and Electron is written in C++. OK, so. Um, Moving on to something that Python is good at, um, which is applications which handle data. So I guess that kind of covers off all the blocks in this chain, which is apps which collect data, process data, do analytics, and then present data back. Uh, each of these stages is in itself an application, and each block in that chain could be written in a different language. I want to give you a really nice example. Uh, this is the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, this picture is a real photograph. It's not created by DALI. Um, this is a, uh, which nebula? The Carina Nebula. Um, if you haven't seen this before, it's amazing. Um, this entire picture was created using Python. So there's a keynote from uh, PyCon Europe from 2022, uh, where the people who work on the James Webb T Space Telescope go through their application architecture how they collected the data from the telescope, how they processed it, how they did the analytics, and then how they created this image. That whole thing was done in Python. Uh, if you've seen the first image of the black hole um, that was uh, released a couple of years ago, that whole thing was done in Python. So uh, you can also see the source code for that online at GitHub slash space telescope. It's really cool. So, uh, Jupyter Notebooks are now the standard tool across all scientific disciplines uh, for working with exploring and analyzing data. Um, this example on the right-hand side is a, a marine science research group in Tasmania, uh, just south of Australia, and they're looking at ocean temperatures. Uh, they all use Python. Uh, everyone uses Python for all of this stuff. Um, and there's a few reasons why, which I'll kind of cover in a minute. but. Um, Another part to data is machine learning and AI. Uh, so Stack Overflow had a survey recently about what libraries people are using for machine learning and AI. Of the top nine, eight of them are Python libraries. Uh, the other one was uh, Apache Spark, um, and which is written in Java, I think. Uh, but the main use case for Apache Spark is using Python anyway. So I'd say nine out of nine are Python. GPT-4 and Llama 2 are mostly written in Python. There's, a whole, there's some back-end code which is using uh, C and C++, uh, but most of it is done in Python. Um, when you look at machine learning and AI, uh, there is a huge ecosystem of tools and libraries. Uh, and these are really, really powerful, mature projects uh, for doing deep learning, neural networks, uh, computer vision, natural language processing. So you've got a lot of tools to get started with. 
um, if another language wanted to come along and try and take Python's lunch, not only they've got to figure out the language aspect, but they've got to create something like Jupyter, and they've got to create the hundreds of thousands of packages which support the scientific community worldwide to even get close to competing with Python. So in summary, uh, Python is number one in this environment. Uh, the ecosystem is mostly Python. AI ML is 90% Python. Um, and even the latest tech trends, like large language models, uh, mostly be written in Python. So I guess one of the things I want to leave you with is a programming language is only as useful as the ecosystem surrounding it. So when people say this Python is the second best language for everything, it kind of misses the point. Um, because the language isn't the important part, it's the ecosystem. So if you are looking at uh, solving a problem, try and work out what ecosystem is going to support you in that. So when it comes to 3D games, are you going to write a game engine from scratch? Or are you going to pick one off the shelf and run with it? If you're doing data science, you're probably going to bring in a whole bunch of libraries. You're not going to write NumPy from scratch uh, just to get started. So. Let's look at this again. Uh, should you use Python 4? Yes, web services, absolutely. Data processing, 100%. Data science, machine learning. Command line applications is a really nice one as well. Python excels at this. Um, in my maybe category, I've got desktop applications, mobile applications, network services, and embedded apps. Um, you can do it, it's possible. Um, it's probably going to be harder than it is in other environments because they have the ecosystem. Um, but you can do it. Uh, in my no category, uh, I've got uh, low-level operating system apps. Uh, I wouldn't write a kernel driver in Python. It might be possible, but I'd, why? Um, uh, and I wouldn't work with 3D graphics in Python either. So is Python the second best language for everything? Uh, actually, Python is the best language for some applications, and absolutely not the second best. Um, and in others, it's probably far from the second best. <laughs> um, 3D graphics is one that we kind of mentioned. Um, but that's actually because of constraints which are outside of Python's control. Like, all operating systems are written in C. The interfaces to them are C. That's not going to change, and that's also not Python's fault. Um, and importantly, no one language is the best at everything anyway. Um, you wouldn't write kernel drivers in JavaScript. Uh, you wouldn't write a web front end in C. Um, so you know, when you're a developer and you're learning languages and you're working with technologies, you're probably going to need to be quite flexible anyway in which technologies you pick and which technologies you use. Uh, and coming back to my important point, the ecosystem is super, super important. So. Um, that kind of wraps up my talk. Um, if you want to know more about some of the stuff I'm working on, I uh, published a book a few years ago called CPython Internals. Um, my blog and all my projects and stuff are on my website. Uh, and also, um, I maintain a, a VS Code extension called VS Code Pets, um, which unfortunately is now the most successful piece of software that I've written. <laughs> Um, but yeah, if you do want to see that, then you can check it out. And we have time for questions as well. So if anyone has any questions. Yeah. Yeah, you Yeah, so um, most embedded systems don't have multiple uh, CPU cores. They've got a single core. Um, it's normally a lower frequency than you would have on a desktop environment. So the thing you need to be really careful of is, I guess, how quick uh, loops can execute. So if you're monitoring on an input for a signal, for example, and then like how fast that loop can run, um, that's super efficient in C because it can write small, tight loops. Um, Python um, it can't quite do that. MicroPython and CircuitPython and the two libraries that I talked about, those are actually technically are probably operating systems. I'd categorize them as. Um, and they've solved some of those problems. So you can write tight loops in Python. 
um, but you're still not going to get to the same level of performance uh, that you would in something like C. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of comes down to what it is that your loops inside your program need to do um, and how much is latency an issue in the requirements. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> For a washing machine, um, I guess you've got uh, sensors that you need to work with. Um, also, when people are building washing machines, um, they buy a bunch of chips from other manufacturers, and they've got to interface with those chips. Um, and they would get all the headers in C. Um, so you kind of, it comes back to the ecosystem point, you would have to kind of build on top of those. Any other questions? There's one at the back. Um, so of the frameworks that you can use to do mobile development, um, what, what do you recommend is the better one if you do want to do it in Python? Um, I think Kivi is a good option at the moment. Um, this, you can, uh, that's the one I think I was going to call out is probably Kivi. Um, also, there was a change like a couple of weeks ago that iOS is going to be an officially supported platform for Python. Lukash is nodding at me. Um, so I think we'll actually see more of this sort of thing in the near future. Um, so iOS is going to be tested and released uh, as a supported platform for Python. Um, so we'll see more mobile frameworks. The engineers who've been working on um, the, all the kind of frameworks that build on mobile apps um, have been asking for this for a, for a while. So I think once that's done and once that's unlocked, we'll start to see more, um, more tools. Um, but kind of coming back to my ecosystem point, like if you're building an iOS app, then like Apple gives you all the frameworks to do push notifications, to do audio, to do networking, it kind of gives you all those SDKs. So the mobile app frameworks kind of build on top of the SDKs and offer you a Python equivalent. Um, but if you're pulling in packages to do extra things, um, then you're going to need to build those yourself. Anyone else? No? Okay, cool. All right, thank you. <laughs>